Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Farm Mihailovich with Waterkeeper Alliance. I'm the Western, or I'm the organizing manager for the U.S. Um, today's webinar is applying Google My Maps, which is part two of a webinar series. Part one a couple weeks ago, many of you attended. Um, part one, if you missed it and would like to catch up or watch it again, it is available on the online Waterkeeper Resource Library, and I would encourage you all to check that out. Uh, like part one. Part two, this, this current webinar will be recorded and I will put it up on the resource library later today. And if you uh, registered, if you're here, you registered, obviously you'll get an email from me with, with an update and notice of when that recording has been posted as well as the deck, the slides from this presentation. Um, a couple other reminders as we get going. You may have noticed that after part one, we created a, a Google group, a, a forum, uh, with the registrants from this webinar series in an attempt to have a place for continuing conversation around these topics. Ron Hall, our presenter, who I'll introduce shortly, is in that Google group and forum, and as, as am I, and monitoring the activity there. And the hope is that if you have continuing questions or curiosities around Google My Maps or other Google tools, you could use that forum, similar to how you use a listserv, to ask questions to one another, to share tips and resources with one, one another, and certainly to engage Ron Hall um, with any of your questions or follow-up. So that group, um, if you registered again, you were you were add to that. If for some reason you want to be taken out of that, please let me know. Um, but I, I do hope that you all find that useful. And it's kind of a trial for us at Waterkeeper too, to see if, if something like that, a dedicated sort of support forum around a topic is needed and wanted. So again, that is, that is something that is available. And speaking of availability, outside of the group itself, I will point out that as Ron said on the first webinar of this series, that Ron is also available individually um, if you'd like to reach out to him uh, with any of your follow-ups or any, any kind of curiosities or questions on this topic and more. A couple other things before we get started here. Um, <clears throat> for those in the Pacific region, uh, our Pacific Region Summit, which is happening in two weeks in the Bay Area, uh, will feature Ron Hall in person leading a series of trainings there as well. And so if you do have sort of like problems or issues or ideas to workshop through, it might be a good idea to be thinking of those and bringing those to the Pacific Summit for a chance to to interact with Ron kind of one-on-one -on -one and, and in a personal setting there to, to go over that. Uh, a couple basic webinar reminders I have. Uh, this webinar, like I said, is being recorded. Uh, we will have time at the end for Q&A. And if you do have questions, you can do that one of two ways. You can type out questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel, and I can monitor questions as they come in and, and save those and read those at the end for Ron to answer. And there's also the hand raising feature on the GoToWebinar control panel that you may use if you have questions you'd like to ask Ron directly. And I can see who has raised their hand and can uh, unmute you and call upon you to, to ask that question. Right now, currently everybody is on mute. so. Uh, those are the two ways you can ask the questions. Um, <clears throat> before I introduce Ron, I would like to just do a three very quick questions, kind of pull the, the attendees here, just so we can get a sense of, uh, um, of who we have on the line. It'll help Ron as he gets into the, the presentation. So I'm going to launch these three quick questions, uh, one of which should be familiar from the first time you attended. But the first question here, and I'll give folks a few seconds. What would best describe your current usage of Google My Maps? Uh, I've never used it, rarely use it, mess around with it quite a bit, or I use it all the time. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and just give this a few more seconds. We got almost everybody in. One more second. Okay, so we'll close the poll there. Um, looks like about 50% never used it, 30% rarely use it, and 20%. Um, use it quite a bit, whereas 0% uh, say they use it all the time. Next poll, this will be a quick one. Um, I just We want to know if you attended or watched the recording of part one of this Google Tools webinar series. We got most folks in, um, as expected. Yeah, we got everybody in. So 75% um, did watch or attend live the first webinar. Uh, if, for those 75%, that answered yes, I'm going to ask this question. If you if you did watch or live or watch later, um, has your Google My Maps usage picked up uh, since then? Yeah, most uh, almost everybody. 
<clears throat> voting here, um, about 80% say it stayed the same, whereas 20% said that it picked up a little bit, and nobody uh, said that they are using it much more now since the first webinar. Uh, well, thanks for indulging those questions. There is going to be one other follow-up that we're going to be asking folks, and this will probably come within, uh, you know, sometime maybe early next week, maybe the end of this week. We do did put together a little survey Ron and I are working on uh, just to get some follow-up information and just to generally see how folks enjoyed or or, or found value of these of this webinar series and um, and maybe even some of the, the Google or the, some of the follow-up resources we've made available. So be going, be on the lookout for that survey as a follow-up. Okay. Now I finally have to get started here. So I would, I'm um, happy to introduce Ron Hall, who um, most of you, as we saw from the polls, heard heard of from a few weeks ago on the first part of this webinar. Uh, Ron is gonna walk through part two of this webinar series here. He's gonna have time for questions at the end. And for those, again, in, from the Pacific region, you'll have your chance to meet Ron in person at the summit if you're attending the summit in a couple of weeks. But Ron, um, certified Google expert um, in lots of different areas. He is here um, to help guide us through part two, applying Google My Maps. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ron Hall. Hi, Bart. Uh, let me just see if I can get things going here. So everybody should be seeing the first slide in my deck. Uh, and just to reference it, in webinar number one, we covered the first items on this agenda. If you're interested, like Bart said, in that he recorded that session, and he also has a link to my slide deck from that first webinar. That slide deck includes several slides that are not in the video that walk you through creating a simple map for those of you that today that haven't really worked with my maps before. And to recap for those that missed the first webinar, we took a look at some examples of maps that have been created and used by water keepers. We provided a general overview of what my maps can do and I gave you a basic orientation to the My Maps user interface. Uh, I walked through the process of creating a simple map and we answered some questions from participants. For those of you that participated in the session or viewed the, the video, I hope you got interested in My Maps and tried using the tool. It looks like maybe it, there was a little bit of an uptick. Today, we're going to move down into the lower part of this agenda and it'll be a deeper dive into using My Maps talking about how to integrate uh, my maps with other Google tools, web resources, and GIS software that you can use to expedite your work. We'll talk about my maps data limits. Uh, we'll cover some tips and tricks and do uh, a demo map and then answer questions. My maps is capable of integrating with other GIS software, like I just mentioned. While there are a number of examples that it, of software it can integrate with, I want to focus today on two major GIS platforms. Esri's ArcGIS and Google Earth Pro, which if you don't know is now free. As this slide indicates, this is actually a three-way relationship because it allows you to leverage the existing work capabilities between Google Earth Pro and ArcGIS. The basis for all of this is the KML file type. You can generate KML files in my maps and export them for direct use in Google Earth or employ ArcGIS's KML to layer tool to views and, and use the My Maps data in ArcGIS. The KML to layer tool allows Esri license holders to collect data from folks that cannot afford Esri software. Conversely, Esri users can share data to people using My Maps by using the Shape to KML tool found in ArcGIS's data conversion tool set. I should mention that when I was approached by the Waterkeepers Alliance about doing this webinar series, one of the key questions was whether my maps could interface with the ArcGIS database the Alliance was assembling to work with members. The answer is definitely yes. My maps users can also use Google Earth Pro to convert Esri shape files to KML. They can view and process them there in Google Earth Pro and then use them in my maps. This gives you access in, to most publicly available GIS data sets on your watershed. This triangular work relationship also allows for additional data manipulation and editing outside of my maps. Once again, the key to all this integration is the Google is the Google's KML file type. Now, I talked about a deep dive. Uh, this is going to be about the extent of it, so you don't have to worry about putting on your scuba gear. What is KML? The K stands for keyhole. 
the company that developed Google Earth and sold it to Google. KML is XML. XML was designed to store and transport data over the web. Translation, uh, you probably have heard of HTML. HTML tells your computer or phone how to display the data it is receiving over the internet. XML tells your computer or phone information about the data it is receiving. There are different sets of XML for each industry or information type. KML is one of the most widely used standards for geographic data. Like all HTML, it is a tag language with tags inserted before and after each key part of the data. Because MyMaps, ArcGIS, and Google Earth Pro can all use KML files, it opens up a world of possibilities for processing content for interactive web maps. Okay, MyMaps also integrates with other Google tools so that you can stay within the MyMaps user interface while working on your map. This capability also allows you to maintain excellent project organization and collaborate your efforts with others. You can use Google Sheets and Google Photos to create and style point data for My Maps. You can use Google Forms to create a My Map by crowdsourcing. You can use Google Photos and YouTube to create and store image and video content for use in My Maps info bubbles for all types of info bubbles. That's points, lines, and polygons. Using YouTube also provides a separate platform for showcasing your work as a waterkeeper, and it gives you the option of adding audio capability to your map. Then there is Google Docs. One project management tip I suggest is to create a Google Doc to track what you're doing on each mapping project and how you did it. At age 65, this is essential for me. Not only will this help you remember the steps you use, but these docs can be used as a manual for other folks who need to interface with a project later or want to replicate it for their own purposes. All of the project work, including the final My Maps map, can be stored in a central Google Drive account. You could share the password to that account associated with the Google Drive to appropriate people or use the collaborator share settings to give access to various folks. Now let's talk a little bit about data collection in My Maps. You can import data that you have collected with a GPS unit directly into My Maps. Just export from the GPS unit in a GPX file format for direct import into Google My Maps. You can also import the GPS data into Google Earth Pro for additional processing, then import it into My Maps. My Maps also has a mobile app, and you can use the My Maps apps to create a map with your mobile device. Currently, this is Android only. A second choice with your phone is to take pictures and use Google Photos to generate point data with the location data that comes along with the image. Uh, this is just a quick screenshot of the Android app to give you an idea what it looks like. Uh, I want to stress that it has less capabilities in the workstation uh, version of My Maps, but it is there and you can use it. Uh, I want to pause here and take a step back. For those of you that <laughs> maybe in the 25%, for those of you that might be interested in using mobile phones to do some serious data collection, I need to mention Open Data Kit, otherwise known as ODK. It's a suite of tools that allows data collection using mobile devices, and you're able to take that data and submit it to an online server, even without an internet connection or mobile carrier service at the time of data collection. You can collect data remotely without an internet connection or cell carrier service. You can put text data, numeric data, media, or more up with a mobile device. For those of you that want to learn more about it, feel free to reach out to me directly or on the forum or just Google ODK. Uh, this is an open source deal. It's done by the University of Washington's Computer Science and Engineering Department in conjunction with a community of players over there called Change. So now you've collected your data uh, and you want to import it. After you've collected your data, you can access the import option of My Maps by clicking the Add Layer button. I'll show this to you in the demo, and choosing the Import button that appears under the new layer that you've just created. You can see that there's no Import button under a layer that's already been created and used. Uh, if you screw any of this up, you can always remember you can always delete the layer or delete an entire map and start over. When the data import dialog opens up, you need to make sure your data is in one of these file types. Don't be intimidated by this slide. I'll try and work you through it. 
the CSV or TSV or, or general text file formats, KML we talked a little bit about. KMZ is actually a is just a zip KML file to compress a little bit, but one of the main uses for KMZ files is to include images that are associated with the data. GPX we just talked about with regard to GPS units, Excel SX, for those of you that run Microsoft Excel, that's where that comes from. Google Sheets, um, I want to remind you that Google Forms is a subset of Sheets. Another way that you can um, put these in is one or more photos in Google Drive or Google Photos. Now, with regard to all these file types and sizing, unzipped KMZ and KML files can be up to five megabytes. Other files can be up to 40 megabytes. Most of those other file types are associated with just point data. You need a minimum of two columns in your data set. And they make sense. One would be the name of the, the point or the feature that you're talking about. The other obviously has to be location data about it. You can have more columns, but that you need a minimum of two. My maps does have constraints on data set size. Any single feature in a data set cannot have more than 50 attributes. Translation on what an attribute is, you cannot have more than 50 columns in your data set. There is a maximum of 10,000 features overall per map. That means the total number of points, lines, and polygons you have in a mind map. You can have up to 10 layers per map. There's also a maximum of 2,000 features per layer. That means that even if your file size is within the, the limits that we just talked about, you can still only upload a maximum of 2,000 rows, points, or whatever per upload or import. The good news is that you can upload 2,000 features. The bad news is that you need to spread your data over a couple layers. We'll talk about this in tips and tricks. Um, finally, you need proper location data in one of the columns. That can be latitude, longitude information, lat long, addresses like full street addresses, place names, and KML geometry. That last category particularly uh, is important for line and polygon data. Collaborating and sharing with my maps. Like Google Cloud documents, you can collaborate with others on my maps. You can also control who can see your map. You access both of these options under the share option that is next to the add layer button. You can directly invite people by sending an email with a message attached. You can customize that message. You can specify if the map will be public, available only to those who get a link in the map, or just shared with a close circle. In all cases, you can allow people to just view the map or be able to edit it as well. Okay, let's talk about a few tips and tricks before I get into starting some demo. When you first start dealing with the editing text box in my maps, you'll find that you have very limited formatting capabilities. Uh, when you hit the return key while you're working uh, in, on, in the text box, uh, if you want to create more space between lines, you hit the return key and it will kick you out of the editing mode. Um, it's kind of annoying, but what I've taken to doing is using a separate Google Doc or text editor to write my, write my text in, then cutting and pasting it into my Maps edit window. window. You can also use the database um, or the table database function, view function that's associated with my Maps to edit balloon content layout and display. We'll talk about that in the demo. Uh, hyperlinks, the only way to include a link in the map description or or the text box. The map description describes the map. The text box is, it has to do with the individual feature point. The only way to do that is to cut and paste the correct URL into the editor, and it will be a live link when you save it. You can't put something over the top of it if you, if you know what I'm talking about. It's just a live URL going in. I know this is not the greatest, but remember this tool is free. So dealing with KML file size or dealing with feature limits, what happens when your file is over five megabytes? This can often be the case with line data, and it's most often the case with that. Use Google Earth Pro to open the file and eliminate any data that's not essential to your map. Uh, you'll end up with a lot of data sets that you download from public entities that have more than what you need because it's, it's an over and large area. Then save the file and looks at it in a file manager to see what the size of it is and check that file size. If you're an Esri user, you can use ArcGIS's clip tool on the data set to cut down the size of the export of KML. 
if you get more familiar with KML and it's not that intimidating, it's just kind of like getting to learn how to run a bicycle. You can open any KML file in a text editor and see if there's a way to eliminate extra text and tags. For those of you that are interested in doing this, uh, Google has a recommendation to use one called JEdit uh, because you can actually put two KML files side by side and work on them and compare them. For those of you that are Esri users, I specifically recommend that you actually take a KML file that you, you exported from your Esri system and compare it with a KML file that is generated when someone imports an Esri shape file into Google Earth. It's amazing to see the difference. Okay, once you get the KML file size down, you may still need to deal with the feature count limitation. As I said before, the toughest data sets to work with in my, in my maps for that are line and polygon data. If you're an Esri user, if you're lucky enough to be that, or unlucky enough, depending on your viewpoint, you can merge polylines to reduce their feature count. You might have to spread the feature count for a particular data set over a couple of layers, like I mentioned before. You can use my maps data table tool to help pinpoint the exact feature that is number 2000, then edit the KML files accordingly. If any of you want to learn how to do this, uh, just reach out to me and I'll walk you through it. Depending on, and then another thing I want to mention, uh, this third point, depending on how you want to tell your story with an interactive map, you can actually insert a link to a second mind map within the info balloon of the main mind map. An example of this might be you know, using mind map with points of interest to walk or hike over a large area than having links within each point info balloon to the line maps of the individual trail routes. Uh, looking for sample map or public mind maps, uh, when, while you have a mind maps page, uh, we might see it today, and it, that has tabs for staff picks and explore, there is currently not a comprehensive gallery of all publicly available mind maps. It's the number one feature request among mind maps users. It's something that used to be there in Google Earth and used to be there in Google Maps, but as they updated in my maps, they haven't put it in yet. There is a kind of a crude walk around that if you want to look for existing my maps on a subject area or geographic area of interest, you can try a Google, general Google search and you use a site parameter. Uh, and remember that there's no, you should have no site, there's no spaces in the site parameter. Maybe that's a deep dive point too, but I throw it in there. Okay. At this time, I kind of want to move over to demonstrating a couple of things, uh, maybe to wake you up a little bit uh, and start eventually taking questions. But I want to let you know before I start that you can feel free to reach out to me by email. We also have got, the, as part mentioned, the user forum up and running, and I'll be monitoring it as well. For those of you that are interested in using Google Forms to generate a mind map by crowdsourcing, there are additional slides in this deck that walk you through the process. Bart will pass out a link after this. Another tip I want to share, and I always do this, is that there are tremendous online resources for learning more about mind maps. In addition to mind maps help, just Google any question about mind maps, and you will find videos, blogs, websites uh, devoted to expanding your knowledge. Okay, so let me reach across here, and here comes the fun part for me. This is a mind map okay, uh, that I created, and what I did it for was for FEMA. Uh, we actually live down in this area here, we're southwest of Spokane, Washington. Uh, I apologize if it's the East Coast usage of the, of, uh, the term, pronunciation of the term Washington for anybody that's in the state. Uh, what this is, is uh, we own some property in this area, and in 2010, FEMA went through and reclassified their floodplain. It was done remotely, from what I could tell by uh, a GIS user out in uh, Washington, Washington DC. And I had some objections to it and I just wanted to interface with FEMA to show them what, uh, what situation was, but I wanted to use some Google tools to do it. So if you look up here and I'm in the editing mode, there's a preview mode. I wanna, anytime you're working in uh, my maps, you can also hit a preview mode. I'll show you that later. But one of the things I wanna show you is when I, this is about a FEMA LOMAR orientation, and LOMAR is a specific type of process that you go through of filling out an online app. What I put right up here is a link. This is just, as you can see, the URL. When I click on that, it actually opens up. This is my Google Doc that I used and associated with this process for 
everything I was doing in the application to, to describe it to somebody so that they could repu replicate it or if they want to know what I went through. I had an online Google Doc and I just cut and pasted the URL for it right into the map uh, description. So this is part of what I was talking about with using a Google Doc. So uh, dropping back down here, uh, what I want to show is we've actually got a couple things on this map and I want to remember to show you that there's a scroll bar. That's what I should point out. If you don't sort of see certain things, there's scroll bars. You should look for them. One is this is our house over here. If I click on it, um, this might take a second for it to load as well because I got so much stuff open. This is a use of video within my map, but it's a use of a specific type of video. It's a 360 video that you can take. I'll be talking about this at the Pacific Summit or be available to talk about it. It's actually a 360 video. And so when you click on it, and once again, I'm subject to, to give you an idea, I'm running on a DSL connection. We'll see how long this takes to go before. Now I've got a C360 video, depending on how your sound is. You can see that all I did was put this in one place and you can rot around, rotate around in 360. I didn't have to walk anywhere, okay? On it, you can only hear the um, air in the background, but if you wanted to, you could add an audio channel. So this is an example of adding a 360 video, or a video particularly. Um, moving back up here, we talked about using a Google photo album. I'll show you, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, I will show you. These are pictures I took to illustrate uh, the problem I had going on here is there's a railroad bed that runs in the in the in this area that separates the floodplain from the field we have across the street. I wanted to kind of give people an idea of what it looks like, so I took some images. With those images, I was able to upload and place them right in Google Maps. But here's what I also put in was a link to the Google Photo album that's associated with that. And I can always come back to that if it takes a little too long. But what this is, it's starting to populate now on my screen, is you can in Google Photos create photos and organize your photos within it. You can actually create a title uh, in that. And then as this populates, you can put a description down. And you can see that there's actually all kinds of photos associated uh, with this particular project. But what you can see here, as far as using Google Photos, is I've got still images and graphics. I'm able to use panoramics. Uh, and one thing I particularly want to mention is anytime you see a photo that looks like this with a little logo in it, that's a 360 image. And you can actually exchange 360 images in Google Photo albums and interact with them. So and we'll talk a little bit more about using Google Photos to generate a map, but I'm using a Google Photos store within accessing it within Google My Maps to add to what we're doing, the capability of it. Um, another thing I want to talk about is GIS download. Uh, we have a six acre parcel that's over here. If I click on that, you can see we've got the parcel number and a legal description. I'm actually looking for it, hold on. Let's turn on this one. This would be the actual FEMA floodplain that we're talking about. And within that FEMA, FEMA flood zone, if you can't see, this was the data that came with the GIS file. Uh, I modified this a little bit, and we'll talk about how I did that with the table tool. But right here, where was the data source? You can click on this with a link. And I got this. What this takes us over to is the City of GIS, or City of Spokane open source GIS data. It shows you exactly where I got the data from. Uh, I was able to download it, and it's the FEMA flood zone. Okay, so I'm able to include that link in case anybody's got, oh, where did you get the data from? Well, I got it from the government. Um, one of the things I want to talk about here is that we talked about the map within a map. Uh, this is actually, if I pull out a little bit, the Marshall Creek, uh, it's a Huck 12. Uh, that's the size of the area. 
I'm sure it's a, it's a denote, denotation most of you are familiar with. Uh, and because I've got so many layers on here, if I want to give people a little bit more information about the local watersheds in here, uh, once I've got, uh, once again, this was the information that came in with the data set, but I modified it. And where it says Spokane watersheds, if I click on that, that'll actually open up uh, another Google My Map. Okay, this is a second My Map that's linked within the first. You can actually see that I've got the Marshall Creek Huck in there, and now what I've got is other information about the watershed. It expands the usage of it. I can actually the Columbia drainage, river drainage, the aquifer tour, different things. There's a Spokane River drainage that I can click on and off. So that's that map within a map concept I was trying to illustrate in tips and trips. Uh, access a, uh, a database to use, some database tool to use uh, for editing. So if we turn on this white parcel, and you can see that I've got an image associated with it. Uh, I've got some text associated with it. I could turn it on and edit it here where I'm actually in this box. And that's where I'm saying if I tried to make a space uh, within a box, literally tried to make a space at the bottom, I hit return to make a space, it'll kick me out. Okay, so that's why I use a text editor. Another tool that I can use if I close this is to go over to the item in the menu associated with it and open up there's an open data tool here if i open that up there's the database okay like it's name and description if i don't like those okay one of the things i can do is the drop down arrow next to the column that i've got highlighted gives me several options for resorting but i can insert a column after that opens up a dialog box where I could change the column name, make sure whatever the top file is that I put the right style of data that goes in it. So I'm going to put a text file in there. I add it, and now you can see I've got one for parcel number. What I can do then is go back over here. Copy that. When I save it, when I go back in, now you can see I've substituted the name one for parcel number. I could do the same thing for description. I could add more columns and put more information in. So this is a very uh, cool way of and quick way of being able to reformat this, especially if you're bringing in uh, funky types of descriptions. If you're an Azure user, you're in the way those columns are labeled, they can be really disingenuous for folks. So one other quick thing I want to show uh, is when I talked about organizing your drive, uh, I've got a, for that particular project, uh, I've got one called FEMA Lomar. I was able to put all the KML data with it in a folder, separate folder. The map, the my map is actually here located in there. I can store it there. I can get to it from my maps. And then I've got that FEMA information deal there. There's a lot of other things I could drop in if I wanted to, uh, but that just kind of gives you an idea how it's all in one place. Uh, one of the things I tell folks as far as, as uh, using um, Google accounts, it doesn't, you don't have to use only one Google account. You can open up a Google account for a specific project. So now I just want to jump over and talk a little bit about uh, importing data. Uh, we talked about before that you access on after adding a layer or by default, there's an untitled layer, so there's nothing into it. Hit the import button and you can learn more about get, if you don't have the slide deck handy. This is where uh, you can learn more about how to put stuff in the, the layer or what the constraints are. And if I import, one of the things, the options you'll see is upload. 
a file from your device or computer that you're using. The file types are spelled out right for you there. You can use Google Drive if you've got the stuff there, or you can use photo albums. Now, this can be a little bit intimidating if you haven't used Google Photos before, but one of the things almost every Google tool has is a search. So if I just search for FEMA, because I made an album, uh, you can see it pulls up various images from that album I had. So if I walk through and just check the images I want, another quick way to do this is there's not a select all function, but you can click and drag um, and do it that way. Now that I've selected, highlighted, you hit the select button. It's copying these into that layer. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I've got a little thing going up on my screen up there that's letting me know it's loading. And keep in mind, the better your broadband connection, the faster this is going to be. I don't want you to be intimidated. Uh, this, by default, it's using the, the common base map. If you want to get a better idea where are those images, if they're correctly located, or if my GPS on my phone wasn't quite right, under the base map option down here, I can choose satellite. And now we've got satellite. Now I can see, even though it's small, that that image is actually for the pump house, so I can click on it. I think it's that one right there. So now that it's open, I can click and drag it over to where I know the pump house is, over in this area, go in, while I've got it open. And place it right there. But you can see that these images are pretty close. And once again, it's taken a little bit of time to process the image because it hasn't, I don't have it in cache yet. But that is images one that uh, was right alongside the railroad tracks in the ditch. The situation for anybody that's curious is that this railroad track connects to the, the valley head wall over here and effectively acts as a dike. Um, so that's one other quick thing I want to show because I talked about using Google Earth to edit your KML and shrink the file size down. The FEMA data set that I got, I imported, it was a shape file, I imported it into uh, Google Earth and converted it. But you can see from this display, it's red. These are all the different areas that are in it and my maps work area is right down in here. So what I ended up doing is if you open up, you can see there's a list of every one of these polygons. If I click on that, you can see that not only did it bring it up, very closely you can see over here that it actually took us to that polygon 327 down over here in the list if i right click on that because it's a, that's the only polygon i want it'll give me an option to do a number of things but save place as so i can save that separately and as a kml file or a kmz file and import it directly into my map and by doing that I've eliminated all the other polygons that are here. I'm shrinking the polygon size down. And you can see there's a ton of them. So now I, I just kind of want to reach out to BART. And we're running at about 40 minutes in. I got a, a, um, a couple things I could also show, but I want to see if you Anybody's got any questions right now, or I can keep rolling along. Yeah, the questions box is still okay. okay. Um, uh, one question that was asked last time um, was whether or not, and I needed to research it, uh, it'll probably show up in the old video if you want to watch it, was somebody asked if you use a Google Sheet to generate 
data for my maps will it automatically update when you increase the entries to the Google Sheet. Uh, this is particularly key, and I, I wasn't unsure about the form or the Google Sheet. What ends up happening, going back over to the, uh, the, the map we're working on, would I'm just going to show you how to delete a layer. Delete this layer. And uh, taking a little bit of time to do that with um, bringing a Google Sheet in. When when you bring it in and it populates, uh, you will get the data associated with the Google Sheet or the Google Form at the time you bring it in. So the hiccup here is you just have to update the map yourself occasionally, depending on how you want to do it, whether it's weekly, monthly. So you'd go in and you delete the layout like I did. Then you would just import from Google Drive the latest results of that sheet. So while that's not quite the same, if any of you happen to be familiar with fusion tables where they update by themselves into a, a map, um, that, that's a, it's a two-step process for doing it, but that's how you do it. Okay, There's, I see no okay, other questions, Ron. Any you, other you ones? Can, no, no other questions, so you can keep going into your next uh, demo that you had. Okay, this is uh, my maps, uh, the user interface that I talked about that as as you start creating maps, this tends to fill up. You can notice this is owned. Uh, this is the all where it all puts in, but it, there's no comprehensive uh, my maps gallery. Uh, there is an explore feature, but you can't really uh, do much more as, as far as search for maps. So you'd go into a, a general Google search window and use that search parameter. One of the things that came up since our last webinar, uh, in our last webinar, somebody asked a question about, can you tell a story with my maps? Um, so a story came up that uh, I thought I'd tell. And I shared this earlier with uh, Bart and the Waterkeepers Alliance, and it's a waterkeeper story. Uh, and this is my map interface I built it in. And just so you can see something a little bit different, I'm going to hit the preview button so you see what the difference is between looking at it. And this is what your viewer would see. So I'm in the editing workspace. Uh, if I hit the preview, it opens up a new tab. This is one that's next to the tab I was working in. And this is what actually would be going out onto the web. So this would be the map. And this, uh, this is because it's a preview, I can dismiss this. It just tells me this how it will look in view mode only. Uh, so this is a little, the Trump National Golf Club in Virginia was cited this past week for cutting down trees on the banks of the river. If I actually hit the drop down button, this is the article. If people want to go and click on that, and it'll tell you the article. Underneath, since I posted this, uh, I think it was right before last weekend, it's, it keeps track of the views. You can share it. Uh, on all kinds of social media. Uh, because this was a water keeper event, uh, we did a couple of different things. There was right at the top one, there's a sign an online petition tab. That it opens up a tab, uh, sign online petition. I pasted a link to the petition here. That'll go over and open up a link to the petition over in a new tab. So you, it only opens new tabs. It doesn't take you away from the main map. So this is where you sign the online petition. So within the map, you're able to direct people over to um, this online petition. Uh, we've got pictures from the site. And this will actually load up in here. A slightly different interface because you're not editing it. Uh, when you go down, there's two photos. It'll show you that you can move back and forth between the photos. This is very much a uh, mobile interface if you're familiar with that. Video explanation, same thing. A video will pop up here. Uh, might take a minute to load. But I found one online. There were several already in YouTube. Uh, not one necessarily associated with uh, the uh, local water keeper, but if you wanted to, we could post one there. Uh, we've got links to the Potomac water keepers or river keepers. Facebook post, uh, just a marker to the Trump National Golf Course, and I put a piece in by the Potomac Conservancy. Uh, they they tend to raise a lot. I do work with various conservancies. They raise awareness about this type of issue. So that's just an example of trying to tell a story with my maps. What I um, 
there is a, a Google Maps storytelling thing called Tour Builder that's totally separate. If you really wanted to get into telling stories that are uh, very specific for um, uh, pieces like storybooks or um, like I did one for the Nez Perce National Historic Trail. So let me kick it back to the main menu. Uh, find out if we've got any more questions. If you do have questions, like what happens to the questions that come up after the webinar? If you download, if you reach out to our, there's my email, and there is the group email to get you uh, to email the the group of the water keepers that we're, we're tracking some of these question lists. And we put Google tools in there, so feel free if you've got questions about anything I covered today to drop into there. Great. So we'll probably have time just for a few questions. We have one now, so we'll get started on why this one's being asked and then answered. If you have other questions, please type them in the questions box. And the question, uh, I'll read this, it's pretty long. Uh, I'm interested in using the map to enter water quality monitoring sample points and the actual data from each site. For example, temperature, conductivity, and so forth. But I have multiple sampling events, and I might want to display data from one sampling event or compare several sampling events. What I do is link to Google Sheets where the data is kept. Can you see the actual data on the map? Uh, if I understand the correct, the question is, uh, on, a, on its initial phase, you can actually use uh, a Google Sheet. Uh, what you need to make sure of is that, I'm assuming if it's point data that you've got lat long, so you need a column with lat long. Uh, a second thing you might be able to do with this is actually put a link. If you're trying to put sampling data data up, it'll. Uh, if you're just using one sample date, okay, for a particular map or it's consistent, um, that'll all the sample sample data comes along with the data, the database that you get. Um, it would it would it would show up over here uh, like on the marshall creek that data table will show up and also be displayed depending on how you had these checked uh in the info balloon so that you don't have to put them all in you can actually go in within the info balloon and check these a second thing you can actually do if i'm understanding that you want to put up multiple dates is you could within each one of those checkpoints, depending on if you've got them for more than one location, you can put the map within the map, um, or possibly even put a link to the Google spreadsheet in there and do it that way. So the answer is yes to both. It's just a matter of imagining and maybe storyboarding your tool set to do it. Uh, you can also use, uh, and with the data import, uh, you don't necessarily have to use a Google Sheet, although I encourage you to do that. Uh, you could use the direct CSV files or GPX files you're using. Uh, we'll have time. We do have time for another question or two. If anyone has one, please type it into the question box. And of course, if you're looking at the screen now, you'll see the Ron's contact information to email him, follow up questions directly, and then the Waterkeeper Google Tools group that we have created. Uh, it's a forum that you can you can use to you can email that email address there to send uh, questions to the whole group here of interested parties who are working with Google tools and Google My Maps. So last call for questions. And for any of you that might be, uh, and for any of you that might be coming to the summit, as much as I do online stuff, I really love, there's no substitute for a site visit um, and meeting people face to face, having tutorials or work hours down there is something I enjoy doing. And I'll be talking about a couple other Google tools that I'm heavily involved with especially Street View 360 images and 360 video because they really you can use this stuff with VR and really showcase your water your watershed. Great. Well, I guess I'll take the time to to thank you, Ron, for your time on these last two webinars for all the time between you know before to get these planned and and orchestrated and then between webinars to take follow up questions and certainly I thank you in advance for the time you'll spend. With people in the whether in the Google group that we've set up personally or on lot or on personal email, and people have direct questions to you, and then certainly for your advanced time at the at the summit in the West. And I would just again really really encourage people to to utilize that Google group that we have created as a way to just continue the conversation around these this topic and share resources and best practices and ideas and ask questions. It's certainly available. Um, 
I'll also just ask that you please pay attention to your email. I'll get the recording of this out as well as Ron's uh, power, his deck, his slides there. Um, I'll get that out as soon as I can to everyone that's registered. And then after that, in a separate email, I will be sending out a quick survey just so we can get a sense from people how this works for them and, and the value they received from this, this webinar series. So please pay attention to your email so I can get those i uh, get some responses from everybody. And, and with that, Ron, I want to thank you very much and thank you all for attending. And that will conclude today's webinar. Have a great day, everybody.